Welcome to Community and Catalyst Achievements, Awards, and Innovations, presented by the College of Humanities and Social Sciences at George Mason University. My name is Natalia Canis, and I am the Student Body President, and I am honored to host this event with my friend and Student Body Vice President, Veronica Mata. Thank you, Natalia. And welcome to all in our Mason community who are joining us. Natalia and I are excited to be here today to share more about Mason, the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, and to celebrate the achievements of the college's dedicated students, faculty, staff, and alumni. Before we move into our programming for the evening, we would like to share our story about being elected to our positions of student body president and vice president and how we are working to help all of Mason students. I guess it all started one Monday evening when I called Veronica frantically, asking her if she'd like to run with me. Thankfully, she said yes, and through that, we were able to launch a successful campaign platform and also just work to better the lives of students and truly be in service. I'm really grateful that we were able to create such a comprehensive platform that included diverse initiatives, including all students and making the Mason experience better for everybody. And I'm thankful to say that with our cabinet, we've been able to advance this platform and make Mason a better place. It's truly a team effort and we're glad for the team we have. When we talk about the need for advocacy and change, it is important to remember that each student at Mason is given the opportunity to receive a foundational education through courses taught in the humanities and social sciences. These courses help students learn how to think and communicate. You're right, Veronica. I am not receiving my degree in a chess discipline, but like many Mason students, I have taken classes like COM 101, which helped me to prepare for public speaking, research, and developing arguments. I've been able to use these skills in other classes and in building the confidence I needed to push me out of my comfort zone and try new things, like running for student body president. I feel the same way. I am grateful for the opportunities I've received through the college's integrative studies program, and I use the research and problem solving skills I've learned in my work with other organizations as well. Natalia and I are both passionate about speaking up for marginalized communities. Natalia is a part of the Anti-Racism and Inclusive Excellence Task Force, and I have conducted research with the Center for Mason Legacy's Black Lives Next Door project. This experience helped show me how important academia is to the issues that impact our society every day. We are standing in Horizon Hall, which is next to the redesigned Wilkins Plaza. In 2016, students, mentored by faculty, delved into the little-known legacy of George Mason IV. The result was the Enslaved Children of George Mason Project, which has evolved significantly in the past five years. Let's learn more about what this important research revealed and how it has transformed our campus. In 2016, a group of George Mason University undergraduates, mentored by faculty, explored the little-known slaveholding legacy of George Mason IV, the American patriot and the university's namesake. The result was the Enslaved Children of George Mason Project, which revealed the lives of the enslaved who lived and worked at Gunston Hall, Mason's home in Northern Virginia. The project led to the creation of the Enslaved People of George Mason Memorial, the centerpiece of the redesigned Wilkins Plaza on the Fairfax campus and a focal point in how we are addressing our institution's identity as it relates to a complicated patriot. Often in my classes, when we begin to discuss George Mason IV, students are familiar with the fact that he penned the Virginia Declaration of Rights and that that document became foundational to our nation's Bill of Rights. They are often surprised to learn that George Mason IV was also a slaveholder. Yes, his name is across our shirts, his image blazed across our campus, and yet only recently have we begun to reckon with the fact that George Mason IV held more than 100 people, men, women, and children in bondage. The four quotes surrounding the Mason statue exemplify four Masons in one. The brilliant legal scholar, the ardent defender of individual freedoms for a limited few, the enslaver of black men, women, and children, and the father of nine who provided for his family at Gunston Hall. Penny, an enslaved child given by Mason to his daughter, animates the experiences of a girl disappeared from the public record. 
She stretches out her hand and navigates a narrow staircase, reminding us of her vulnerability, her strength and resistance, as if to say no more. Compelled to serve George Mason, James offers a quill for writing declarations, his fist symbolizing resilience and a reckoning. At the bottom of the water fountain is a stone pattern symbolizing an African custom practiced at Mason's Gunston Hall Plantation. Enslaved people came to this ritual site to pray and to look to their origins across the sea. The late Roger Wilkins was an African-American civil rights leader, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, and a former Mason professor. This plaza is dedicated to his legacy. As he said, we have no hope of solving our problems without harnessing the diversity, the energy, and the creativity of all our people. Thank you, Natalia and Veronica, for this opportunity to offer words of welcome to tonight's program. As you've just seen, the design of the enslaved people of George Mason Memorial on Wilkins Plaza was inspired by archival research that undergraduates working side by side with their faculty mentors began in 2017. This team-based research on the complicated historical legacies of our university's namesake continues today in honors college courses, in history department courses, and in collaborative interdisciplinary projects sponsored by the Center for Mason Legacies, which is one of our college's newest research centers and is jointly sponsored with the university libraries. I sincerely hope that everyone attending tonight's virtual event has the opportunity to visit the memorial in person right here outside Horizon Hall on the plaza at the very heart of the Fairfax campus that is named after Roger Wilkins, a chess faculty member and scholar of African American history who was truly beloved by generations of students and faculty colleagues. When you visit the memorial, you'll have a chance to experience for yourselves an especially stunning example of how our faculty's teaching and research activities not only dovetail and reinforce each other in this college, but also have real world impact, and in this particular case, have transformed our own campus. You'll have a chance to learn about several other great examples of chess faculty-led work with and for Mason students, and the pride our faculty take in working at a university for the world later in tonight's program. But I invite you now to join me in celebrating the winner of the college's newest award for faculty and staff, our Faculty Staff Civic Excellence Award. This award is designated for a faculty or staff member who, in fulfilling their teaching, research, or administrative responsibilities, demonstrates a deep and abiding commitment to helping our students become engaged citizens and well-rounded scholars who are prepared to act. The recipient of this award embodies civic excellence as a core value at Mason and models its application in arenas of public life far beyond the university community leading by example and fostering lifelong learning and teaching in ways that equitably serve all human beings. Dr. Spencer Crew, the Clarence J. Robinson Professor of American, African American, and Public History is the inaugural recipient of this prestigious new college award. Dr. Crew has worked in public history institutions for more than 30 years. He continues to serve as a museum curator and educator, and his career includes more than 20 years of service at the National Museum of American History, including as its director from 1994 to 2001. A highly regarded and accomplished scholar of the Underground Railroad, he is the founding president of the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. He recently served for 18 months as interim director of the Smithsonian's newest museum, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and he just finished working there on a new exhibition entitled Make Good the Promises, Reconstruction and Its Legacies. Professor Crew is or has served as the chair of the National Council for History Education, 
board member of the National Trust for Historic Preservation and a board member on the nominating board of the Organization of American Historians. As a member of our faculty, he teaches classes in the Department of History and Art History and in Mason's Honors College, and has been a mentor to students and faculty colleagues alike. Through his museum leadership and his engagement in both museum-based and university-based educational programming throughout his distinguished career, Dr. Crew has brought hidden histories and untold stories into the public limelight and has made history accessible to diverse audiences across the country. I am truly in awe of Dr. Crew's lifetime of career accomplishments. Please join me in celebrating and congratulating Dr. Crew as the inaugural recipient of the Dean's Faculty Staff Award for Civic Excellence. We want to share with you now a video that showcases two additional examples of current faculty research and teaching in the college and that introduces you to a current chess student who exemplifies the kind of passion and commitment to making a difference in the world, to being change agents and catalysts for the creation of a better world for everyone who comes after them that motivates and drives this college's students. I am truly humbled and in awe of our students as well as our faculty's career ambitions and accomplishments. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Chess alum, for your contributions to the Chess community of alumni. Enjoy this next video montage. of the humanities and the social sciences matter. We as a country are besieged by problems that require humanities skills in solving. Written communication, oral and digital communication, intercultural competency, they are absolutely fundamental to whatever world of work a student is going into. The work for us in working with all of the university students. We want to make sure that you're ready to take on leadership roles in a chosen career path. We literally are working with students across the course of their training as undergraduates. We're at the center of it all. As the signage around this building used to say when it was just a construction site. And we take a lot of pride in that. President Washington has a vision of Mason's contributions to solving the problems of the 21st century. Healthy planet, healthy people, healthy society, healthy economy. The College of Humanities and Social Sciences has faculty working on all four of those dimensions. We have climate communication scientists in the Department of Communication. We have faculty in that same department who are interested in black women's health issues. I'm thinking of psychology, for example. The research Research that the faculty are doing, it ranges from clinical psych on one end to human factors and industrial and organizational. And what Rashad and Seth are doing is such an amazing sort of thinking about how psych as a discipline has real world relevance in a way that often doesn't get captured in people's thinking about what psychology is. So psychology, first of all, is the study of how human beings think, feel, and behave. And so industrial and organizational psychology is the study of how human beings think, feel, and behave as regards their work or jobs. We all know that work can be emotional, stress, people experience anger. So Rishad Dalal and I have been working on a project based on the idea of just-in-time adaptive interventions. The work we're doing specifically focuses on emotion regulation, and so it's a brief in a one or two minute activity. They just have to write a little bit in response to a prompt, and then we measure their mood again to see if that made them feel better. If you think about so many of the problems facing the world today, we need economists, psychologists, sociologists, historians, political scientists. We can have the best technology, but ultimately it's up to people to make decisions, and, and those decisions should be informed. Those are ultimately decisions that reflect the social sciences and humanities to make. We're not doing work with and for just chess students. The populations that need that really cutting edge training in writing and, and speaking practices is, is the university population at large. 
So the Calm Lab, which is a recently renovated space in the Johnson Center where graduate students and faculty are providing services to undergraduates as well as graduate students in training related to writing and public speaking. So it's a lab because it's a space to do research, but it's also serving student needs. The complexities of our world are always multiplying, it seems, and particularly in our current place where we are. I think the importance of teaching those skills to students is even more important than ever, and giving them a space to practice them. And that's what the lab really does, is it gives students a place to talk with one another, peer to peer, outside of the stressors of the classroom. The student-facing centers serve students from across the university. All majors, all programs of study, graduates and undergraduates. Our hope with this gorgeous studio space is that students will just come work here and maybe they'll hit a wall or they'll have a question and then they'll go to the front desk and say, do you have someone I can talk to about this speech I'm working on and this presentation I'm working on? We do the research, right? We find out what's working well and what's not and then we go back to make what it is we're studying better. And that's what I think is really important about the lab, is that we're not just building communication skills for students, both written and oral mm -hmm. communication skills. That's really important, but we're also studying how we're doing that to find out whether we're doing it as well as possible and continually improving our practices. Nobody just comes to Mason. They come to Mason because it's the world. The students on this campus represent the world. What they bring is their passion for serving this community. Dominique is just amazing in that regard. I think of her as a kind of a poster child, replicator a gazillion times, and you've got the chess student, right? She's given back so much to this university. We just watch her and think, oh my gosh, who is she gonna be 25 years from now? So my freshman year, I was a student senator for student government where I sat on the Diversity and Multicultural Affairs Committee. I also was the NAACP chapter on campus president and then vice president. I sat on um, President Washington's Anti-Racism Inclusive Excellence Task Force. My biggest goal as of right now is to be Secretary of Education. Hopefully I'll be able to do that. I think I can. So that's what I hope to do is, is lead in, in education. I think chess prepares educators specifically because it's like you never know what that kid is walking into the classroom with. You never know what type of hidden baggage, invisible luggage they have with them from home. And so when you're able to adjust yourself to approach that child and approach their way of learning, if we don't know how to teach based on like what the child is interested in, it stops us from you know, maximizing their potential. And so chess prepares me for that. It prepares the rest of the students for that, whether they want to teach or not, because you can see potential in something and then it's like, okay, how do I maximize the potential in that thing? And I think that's what chess does. Horizon Hall is right next to the Johnson Center where the lab is. Mm -hmm. This is the heart of campus. This central location that really is the heart and soul of campus does signify the importance of the communities to the entire university, and that's important too. Humanities and social sciences are fundamental to what it means to have a college education and to be prepared to go out and change the world. I'm fascinated to see how students are working in this building, whatever time of day it is. It's a place where you feel like the work you're doing matters, but if you need to be left alone to do that work, it's a quiet space. It's nice to have a home. I'm so glad that I'm still here when it was built and to know that like that's my building and it looks amazing and it's beautiful and it's new. I think it also represents what chess is. Sometimes people underestimate the humanities and social sciences. So I, I'm excited to see what type of events or, or engagement opportunities come. The opportunity going forward to integrate research and teaching and building on this great 50-year foundation of teaching impact. We're in the business of opening doors in the sense of making sure that we're taking advantage of our networks to help students find the people that can mentor them toward whatever their next thing is that they want to do. Students in the connections they make and the work that they do with faculty, side by side with faculty, are changing us, right? Transforming the institution. The transformation is of the place and of the people who work with students, not just faculty transforming students.
Wow, that was incredibly powerful. The picture Dean Artist leaves us with of students working side by side with faculty is duplicated throughout the college. Chess has a strong history of integrating research and teaching. Another example of this can be found at the GMU Center for Psychological Services. That's right, Natalia. The center's mission is twofold to train Mason graduate students in the practice of psychology while offering evidence-based services accessible to anyone regardless of income. In November 2020, the center began providing free therapy to essential workers impacted by the pandemic. Let's meet the staff who have made these services possible and the essential workers who have been supported through this program. I think for anybody, right, you know, who's on the planet right now, this has been a stressful time. But for folks who have been essential workers, they have had to sort of navigate that life of not being able to choose to stay at home, not being able to choose to self-quarantine, especially if they're faced with having to choose between losing a job or putting themselves in what might be danger. When I, I found out we were gonna be a COVID unit at the hospital. I panicked because I have asthma and I consider it a high risk disease. One of the best parts of teaching is being with students all day. I feel so lucky to have my job. And during COVID, all of the lovely things about teaching uh, were taken away. A lot of essential workers that have called in, they're saying that it's been this increased stress load over a year and a half nearly now that they haven't gotten any help. And so we started talking about was there a way for us to help and reach those folks knowing that traditional therapy services may not be realistic for them. Sifting through all the information out there, all the support and figuring out insurance, if insurance would cover certain programs. I tried to reach out to therapists that were in my insurance group. They, they, they weren't accepting any new patients. So it was a difficult thing to get therapy to begin with. We came up with the idea of developing um, the emotional support warm line. So what they can do is 12 hours a day, every day, call in and say, hey, I'm having a really hard time. I need help. I learned to cool down my face. I would literally go to the sink and get some cold water. As my therapist said, it um, cooling the emotional temperature as well. And uh, that's one that I use a lot. I continue to use it. Maybe six months ago, I would have really questioned my capacity to continue teaching. But at this point, I feel confident and capable. But I've learned a lot about myself and the things I've learned from the situation, I know I will carry with me for, honestly, for the rest of my life. We really serve as a bridge between George Mason University and the, and the community. You know, not only are we training the next generation of behavioral health providers, but we're serving our community in a way that, that is very tangible and real. People are having mental health crises, and if there's not a team there, there's not people there to help them, then these are community members that we're relying on in a crisis that aren't gonna be there, like our doctors, our nurses. When you're depressed and when you need the help, you, you don't instinctively seek, seek that help. And to take that first step is difficult. And thinking about paying for it sometimes is a, night, is a nightmare. And so I think having this free program, at least to begin with, is so, so invaluable for the community. You know, we really appreciated Libby and Morel sharing their experiences with us. Yeah, no, it was great to be able to, to hear them talk and share their stories and to see the impact that we're able to have and, and to know that people are able to call in and, and get that kind of support when they need it. Our hope, obviously, is that we're able to impact more people, um, given that our emotional support call line is open to everyone. Definitely. The services we offer are crucial to providing care for our communities as we continue to navigate the uncertainties of the pandemic. Barriers to services include access and affordability. We've heard that over and over. It is our aim to break down these barriers. We're excited to announce that since the filming of the video we just watched, we received funding from Mason to help expand the emotional support line to include all Mason students, faculty, and staff at no cost to them. 
we're also collaborating with other departments at Mason to help serve this broad need. Absolutely. We are working with Mason's Counseling and Psychological Services, the Center for the Advancement of Well-Being, and the Psychiatric Nurse Practitioner Program, a program in the College of Health and Human Services. Expanding this program will involve the best of Mason, training the next generation of behavioral health practitioners, as well as providing immediate, critical emotional support to our community. Offering these services fills a gap in care to our Mason and surrounding communities, and we are proud to serve as the lead in creating accessible mental health care services. If you or anyone is in need of support, you can call the Emotional Support Line for free to speak confidentially with a trained provider about stress, anxiety, depression, or grief. The phone line is anonymous and confidential. The support line number is 703-215-1892. And the line is open daily from 8.30 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. Thank you, Dr. Mellenbeck and Dr. Renshaw, for sharing these updates about the crucial services that the GMU Center for Psychological Services offers to our Northern Virginia community. As seniors, Veronica and I have been reflecting on some of our favorite Mason experiences over the past years. I would say some of my favorite experiences at Mason have been being a part of Greek life and always having a community to fall back on, whether it was studying in the JC or hanging out in Fenwick. One of my favorite memories as well is meeting Vice President Kamala Harris. That was definitely a really great moment for you, and I think I can speak for both of us when we say being President and Vice President is going to be some of our favorite memories when we graduate. Of course. As you can tell, we have had incredible opportunities at Mason and have truly enjoyed our time on campus. We'll now hear from some chess students as they share a glimpse into their everyday lives. Hi everyone, I'm Morgan. I'm Jordan, a chess ambassador here at George Mason University. And I'm gonna take you along on a typical day of a Mason student, so let's go. So hopefully uh, this is something you guys find interesting and you guys gather some good information from this video. Just got to campus and I have a business class at nine o'clock, but before I go, I'm gonna go get some Starbucks. I just got to campus with three minutes left to spare before my first class. Uh, my first course is mental illness and criminal justice. So now that I have my Starbucks, I'm on my way to class and I'll talk to you guys after. It's 10, 12 a.m. and I just finished my mental illness and criminal justice course. Uh, now I'm sitting in the JC and my next class is at 12. So I got plenty of time to work on some homework, um, drink some coffee and just relax. So now that I had breakfast, I have to go to work. So I work at a law firm that specializes in educational law and I work as a legal assistant. It's 11.49 now and I have um, psych honors for my next course. So basically for that, we just relax and talk about grad school. And there I do a number of things. I assist the attorneys with pretty much whatever they need. So yeah, that's a fun uh, one hour and 15 minute seminar. But I have that class in Horizon Hall, which is the um, new, it's the new building, so it's really nice and really chill. It's about two o'clock and I'm just leaving work and I'm going to go to campus and get some lunch. If you guys didn't know, GMU is actually the, na the nation's fastest growing public research university. And I only know that because they have it right there on that big poster. On a typical Wednesday, I would get lunch and then eat it in the JC while I did some homework. But before I get lunch, I'm going to pass out our flyers. It's 2.38 uh, p.m. and I finished my honors psych class at um, 1.15. So I've basically just been chilling, relaxing on campus, um, just waiting for my next course, which is uh, Psych 380 or Intro to Forensic Psych. And that's at 3 p.m. and that goes from 3 to 4.15. I'm on my way to my second and final class for the day, which is my government class, and I really like this class. We just finished reading Just Mercy, the Brian Stevenson story, and I loved it, so I'm really excited to talk about it in class today. School day's over for me. I can finally uh, head back home and eat some food. Um, I'm sitting in Wilkins, Wilkins Plaza right now, which they just finished construction on, I think, this year. Okay, so I just got out of class. It is a two and a half hour class, so I am exhausted but the best way I like to relax is to go get some food. Hopefully you guys uh, enjoyed what it's like to be um, a GMU student day in the life, and yeah, have a good rest of your day. Thanks for watching. So it's about nine o'clock and I'm home. Um, I'm gonna do about three or four hours worth of homework now, and then I'm gonna get ready for tomorrow. But 
I'm gonna close this off here. I hope you enjoyed a day in the life of a Mason student, and this was fun. Thanks for watching. Those were great videos. Students like these are the reason I've decided to stay connected with Mason as an alum. When I was a student, my experience here helped me look at the financial world through the lens of incentives and choices and markets to help uncover new solutions to the persistent problems in our society. I believe Mason helped me reach my professional goals, which is why I enjoy volunteering my time and helping students think outside of the box as they consider their own career goals. One way I do this is through the Chess Alumni Chapter. Our mission is to enhance the interest and reputation of the college and achieve closer fellowship between alumni, students, faculty, staff, and the community. Our chapter members live in all parts of the country. We have military veterans, first-generation students, and those who identify with underrepresented communities. We also span five decades of graduates. As part of our service to the college, the chapter is proud to offer awards to deserving Chess students. This year, we are awarding Heaven Miller and Sidney Johnson. Heaven is a sophomore pursuing a Bachelor of Science degree in Criminology, Law, and Society. Heaven picked Mason because of its proximity to DC and the university's community atmosphere. She enjoys being part of Chess because it gives her the foundation to build future connections and relationships with people. Sydney is a junior pursuing a Bachelor of Arts in Communication with a double concentration in Journalism and Media Production and Criticism. She is also minoring in Italian Studies. Sydney is a sister of Alpha Omicron Pi, Vice President of the Society of Professional Journalists, and a staff writer for the Fourth Estate Culture Section. She feels the diverse chess community has helped support her and given her drive to chase her dreams. Congratulations, Heaven and Sydney. One of the reasons I've loved being a student at Mason is because I've been able to explore my passions and find opportunities on campus that help stretch my skills. I agree. At Mason, students can choose from more than 460 organizations and become involved with intramural or club teams. There are also opportunities to participate in discipline-related activities and programs. One of these programs is Mason's Forensic Team, which is part of the Department of Communication. That's right, Natalia. The Forensics Team is an intercollegiate speech team and is open to Mason students of any major. Forensics is public speaking and oral interpretation of literature with events designed to focus on the ways spoken word can be used to persuade or move an audience. The team represents the university at regional and national speech competitions. Mason's Forensic Team includes about 25 students from across the university. These students research, write, and complete analytical exercises to construct their speeches. Topics range from events happening around the world and issues surrounding identity. Students engage in self-directed learning and are encouraged to use the power of their voice to problem solve from a creative direction. We are excited to introduce a member of the team, Gustavo Lanz. He's an out-of-state student who came to Mason from Florida, and he's originally from Venezuela. He's working on a Bachelor of Arts in Government and International Politics with a minor in Data Analysis. Gustavo first became involved with speech in high school and later attended a summer camp at Mason. After learning about our forensic team, he realized that he could continue his passion, which is what led him to choose Mason. Before we turn it over to Gustavo, there's one more detail we want to share. What we haven't mentioned yet is that when students compete, they're given a quote around which they are expected to craft their speech. Once they have the quote, they only have seven minutes to write their piece. Gustavo is about to give us an exclusive performance and he followed those same competition rules. That's amazing. I didn't realize he only had seven minutes to create a speech. I can't wait to see what he has prepared for us now. Let's see. It was a really confusing time in Wall Street when the number one day trader in the country was a monkey? But around 2004, Goldman Sachs adopted a pet monkey they named Raven and had her pick the stocks it would invest in by throwing darts at a board. They created a portfolio specifically for her that everybody across the country could buy into called Monkey Dex. But by 2006, Monkey Dex was returning gains of 213% and made the activity of trading more inclusive throughout the entire country. It's this idea that we should look to be more inclusive whether through diversity of people, thoughts, and within our individual actions, that's best reflected in today's quotation by Roger Wilkins. We have no hope of solving our problems without harnessing the diversity, the energy, and the creativity of all our peoples. What Roger Wilkins is trying to tell us is that we should look to be as inclusive as possible, whether through our population, our thoughts, and within our actions, because it's the only way we can harness progressive and, comp and competent communities. And we have to agree with Roger Wilkins. More specifically, because first, inclusivity leads to better collaboration. And second, because inclusivity strengthens our communities. But first, 
we have to agree with Roger Wilkins because inclusivity leads to better collaboration. Essentially, when we look to be more inclusive in our everyday life and our individual actions, whether through diversity of thought or people, we allow for better interpersonal collaboration. And we see two examples of how this is true through first, Basquiat's collaboration with Comte des Garçons and the Anarchist's Atlas. But first, Basquiat was an artist coming out of Brooklyn from the 70s and 80s. And he, alongside many of his contemporaries in the art world, were for a long time trying to break into high fashion with little success. Until Basquiat was given a chance by Comte des Garçons, a Japanese brand named in French. However, by bringing him on board for a spring summer run in the summer of 1986, a year before his untimely death, Basquiat was able to break barriers for artists within high fashion who had long been kept out of the pearly gates by fashion itself. Ultimately, by choosing to be more inclusive in who they sought to represent and the ideas they brought on, high fashion learned that by being more inclusive, we lead to better collaboration that helps everybody. Second, the Anarchist Atlas, if you haven't heard of it, is a free-to-everybody piece of source code run by communists that is meant solely to compile international information on leftist movements. If that sounds like a lot, wait until you hear about the fact that the creators of the Anarchist Atlas allow it to be edited by everybody. They state that if everybody is able to edit who has information and access to the Anarchist Atlas, then they ultimately reach the peak form of collaboration in which everybody, regardless of where they are or what access to technology they have at their disposal, can collaborate and bring solidarity to everybody across the globe. This is a key example of how being more inclusive in our actions and our thoughts leads to better collaboration. It's exactly what Roger Wilkins is talking about. Because by looking out for each other, we strengthen our ability to collaborate and our communities. And that's the second reason as to why we have to agree with today's quotation. Because by being more inclusive, we strengthen our communities. Basically, when we represent more people and more thoughts, our communities grow stronger as a result. And we can see how this is true through first, the Venezuelan band Rawayana, and second, Botswana and Cowboys. But first, Rawayana, a Venezuelan reggae band, has an anomaly of success. Because since the mid-2010s, the Venezuelan music scene has been crushed by a repressive government and American sanctions. Rawayana is the exception, not the norm. But in their tours, they make it a point to bring on other Venezuelan artists to open for them, specifically Afro-Venezuelan artists who have long been denied the spotlight. Through this action, they strengthen the bonds of the Venezuelan artist community and represent a more diverse face of the country and its art, not just to the globe, but to a country that for a long time has been deprived of joy. Second, Botswana's metalhead cowboys are two things. One, a mouthful of a sentence. And second, a community of queer youth who find each other by dressing up like leather-clad cowboys and listening to death metal. The reason as to why they say they partake in the action is because Botswana has long repressed its queer community. And by doing this, it's the only real action they can take to strengthen their community and find each other bringing a very diverse and out of left field idea as a way through which they can bond and be with each other. By doing this, they embody what Roger Wilkins is talking about. Diversity strengthens our communities, and this is a necessary option we need to take every day. And so, when returning to today's quotation by Roger Wilkins, we have no hope of solving our problems without harnessing the diversity, the energy, and the creativity of all our people. We absolutely agree, because it leads to better collaboration and it strengthens our communities. Even here in communities like Chess and Mason, we have people from all walks of life with diverse thoughts, beliefs, and backgrounds. We should be increasingly and more inclusive now than ever. It strengthens our communities and allows us to connect with each other in ways we would have never expected. And that's both the point of college and a way through which we can really empathize and connect with each other in ways that strengthen not just Chess or Mason, but our lives and our country as a whole. That was an incredible performance. I am so impressed with Gustavo's ability to interpret and help us think about Roger Wilkins' words of what it means to solve problems with the diversity, the energy, and the creativity of all our people. 
That was truly remarkable, and Gustavo is ranked in the top 12 speakers in the country, and he also represents a remarkable team. In March, the forensics team competed in the National Speech Championship and placed second out of almost 40 schools. The team has a long-standing history of success. They have consistently ranked in the national top 35 schools every year since 1975, the top five schools each year since 2007, and they were national champions in 1979. Mason is one of the few schools on a national level that has competed and remained among the top programs for the past 20 years. We now want to recognize our Distinguished Alumni Awardees. These awardees represent the college's academic departments and programs. In addition, we are also recognizing two alumni for their outstanding leadership and service to the community. And for this honor, I will turn it back to Dean Artis. The impacts chess alumni make in our communities, here in Northern Virginia certainly, but also elsewhere in the U.S. and globally, exemplify our college's commitment to creating engaged citizens and well-rounded scholars who are prepared to serve. Chess alumni find different ways to put their education and research training in the humanities and social sciences to work in the world after they graduate. Sometimes their careers are in fields directly related to their course of study as undergraduates or as graduate students. Just as often though, their passions lead them toward opportunities they never even imagined for themselves as students. That's the secret sauce, if you will, of a college like Chess. We are preparing students for a lifetime of opportunities, both personal and professional, that may or may not be anticipated when a student starts their training. Learning how to learn, learning how to lead, learning how to communicate clearly and concisely, even when the human situations you're dealing with and the data sets you're analyzing are complex and messy and ever evolving. These are the so-called soft skills you develop as a student in the humanities and the social sciences that are essential to being successful in any field. I continue to be inspired with the accomplishments of our Chess alumni and have enjoyed the opportunity to meet and collaborate with many as they volunteer their time and talents to the college. In just a few moments, you will meet our distinguished alumni who represent each of our college's 22 departments and programs. These awards were peer nominated and exemplify the myriad ways in which Chess alumni are leaders, change agents, and engaged citizens in their communities. Now, I'm honored to present the 2020-21 Chess Distinguished Alumni. For me, being a Mason graduate has meant opportunity and open doors. For me, I'm proud to be a Mason graduate. In short, it's my second family. I think being a Mason graduate, um, uh, having purpose. A true blessing. Lifelong learning. To be inquisitive. Power and purpose. An interdisciplinary scholar. To be on the cutting edge. And a good citizen of their region, country, and the world. I think of the word community. Community involvement and empowerment. To be a globally conscious person. Having a spirit of resistance. Commitment to serving a public good. Global community. Universal citizen. I think to me, being a Mason graduate means being driven and being determined. These individuals exemplify the adaptability of a humanities and social sciences education and what it means to be a Mason graduate.
Mason graduates are engaged citizens, well-rounded scholars, and are prepared to act. Our alumni are taking active roles towards confronting essential questions and problems in our society. We invite you to learn more about these awardees by visiting our website. There you will find each distinguished alumni is featured in their own video, where they highlight career insights and motivations, and share about the faculty member who inspired them. Natalia, you mentioned that our alumni help confront essential questions and problems in our society. Earlier this year, our president, Dr. Gregory Washington, pinpointed four key areas where George Mason University can shift the needle on the most significant problems of our time. Healthy planet, healthy people, healthy economy, and healthy society. It will indeed take our entire Mason community, students, faculty, staff, alumni, and our community partners working together. Let's learn more from Dr. Washington. These are the problems that will have a profound effect on our life. They affect all of us, and they affect all of us in a significant way. The biggest challenges are where universities are going to make their name. Who's solving them? Who is the rest of the world listening to? What do your scholars have to say on these issues? That's what's going to determine the very future of our institution. If we're not focused there, then by definition, we are saying we're lesser than. There are a host of really significant scholars here. And when you have scholars who are studying and dealing with the problem, you know that Mason is a part of the global solution to these challenges. The great thing about Mason is that we already have people here who think counterculture. That differentness of thinking is what's going to be necessary as we move forward. If you are going to be significant, you have to tackle the significant problems. Our college's research contributions were instrumental in Mason's recent achievement of R1 classification. Our faculty are enormously and rightfully proud of that and see opportunities ahead for even more expansive engagement in transdisciplinary research that's being supported through the university's institutes and centers of excellence, as well as through research centers and unit-specific research activities within the college. In all of these different venues, our faculty are pursuing research of consequence, addressing the significant challenges of our time, social inequality, public health, economic decline, climate change. And they are engaging our undergraduates as well as our graduate students in this work. As we continue to grapple locally, nationally, and globally with the wicked problems of our time, I would ask you to keep in mind that the skills a student develops through education and research training in the humanities and social sciences are foundational and fundamental to this next generation of global problem solving. Now, more than ever, the world needs the kinds of higher order human skills that AI and robots cannot replicate, but that are central to our disciplines, our disciplines. Creativity, curiosity, critical thinking, imagination, empathy, human communication skills, and cross-cultural competencies. Our world needs creative, nuance attuned critical thinkers who can work side by side with scientists and policymakers on complexly scaffolded projects and issues that require not only system level conceptualization, but attentiveness to individual human experience and the diversity of human experience. CHESS stands ready to help all of Mason students create the changes that will make our communities a better place. And our college has a very critical role to play in all of the exciting opportunities that undoubtedly lie ahead for this university in pursuing research of consequence and in preparing all of our students well for human work in an age of smart machines. CHESS faculty and staff provide outsized contributions to Mason's vision, mission, and values as a comprehensive public research university that serves a majority-minority and high first-generation college student population. 
our faculty prioritizes access to excellence over exclusivity and values excellence in both teaching and research. Each year the college celebrates alumni who are also faculty or staff members at the university and this particularly distinct group of alumni have been selected for demonstrating exemplary personal service and commitment to our university community. I am proud to celebrate Chess Distinguished alumni who continue to share of their passion for the university's mission through their dedication to teaching, research, student services support, and partnerships. I had the opportunity to surprise our four awardees earlier this month, and I'd like to share those moments with you now. Some engagement. I've asked some of our people to come up and support us, and uh, I brought in some reinforcements to help me with this, this announcement item. All right? I promise you, this is the most formal part of the luncheon, right? Uh, I just wanted to take a brief moment to welcome each and every one of you to our Dean's Luncheon. This is not a <laughs> Hello. Are you in the right place? Yes. You yes. are in the right place. <laughs> You're in the precisely right place. You are in the right place. Thank you, Dr. Washington. All right. Could Rose Pasquale, oh. Paul Liberty, please come forward? What? This could be good. Which squid game is this? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you're actually looking surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to throw something else out of <laughs> Every fall, the College of Humanities and Social Sciences hosts an event celebrating distinguished alumni, faculty, staff, and students. Troy is a 2021 recipient of the college's, the college's Distinguished Alumni. <laughs> <laughs> Extremely honored to recognize Casey Klimmer as the College of Humanities and Social Sciences Senior of the Year. Casey is a graduating senior in Integrative Studies with a concentration in Women and Gender Studies. He's also an accelerated MIIS student with a concentration in Social Justice and Human Rights. With his degrees, Casey has focused on queer issues and activism and expects his future work to focus on immigration issues with transgender migrants. Since his freshman year, Casey has worked as a mentor in the Women and Gender Studies Center. During this time, he has updated and curated the center's extensive library and developed and implemented an intersectionality training module for the university community. He also works as a student coordinator for the LGBTQ Resources Center, where he coordinates the Safe Zone program enrollment and maintains the center. Finally, Casey is a founding member of the Queer Student Leadership Council. This group works to connect queer students to resources on campus. Casey is driven by social justice issues and cares strongly about equity and equality and making sure that all people have access to resources and tools that meet their needs. Casey was selected as Senior of the Year for his outstanding contributions in academic excellence, participation in student life, service to the university, and transformational leadership. Casey, on behalf of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, congratulations. Thank you for joining our Community and Catalyst event. As you can see, we are extremely proud of our CHESS alumni, faculty, staff, and students who serve as leaders, change agents, and engaged citizens. 
It is through your work and service that our communities are stronger. We invite you to stay connected to the college as we continue our mission to serve all Mason students and our community. We have opportunities to mentor, speak in a classroom, and to remain engaged in the life of the college. When you share your time and talents, you create opportunities to transform the student experience. The contributions CHESS makes to research, teaching, and service are evident. It is clear the college stands ready to help Mason students create the changes that will make our community a better place. And we hope that you will join us. Thank you so much for logging into our event tonight. We had so much fun hosting it, and as always, Go, Go Patriots! Patriots.